Well, it's a great delight to uh, welcome to this uh, chat uh, a dear friend, a former colleague, Jayakuma Christian, National Director of uh, World Vision India, theologian, author, uh, activist. Welcome, Jayakuma. Hey, Tim, thank you very much. So good to be with you. After almost 100 years, it seems. Like <laughs> it's a long time. It's a long, <laughs> it we're both dinosaurs. We should be extinct. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tim, for this opportunity. Thank you. So Jaya is speaking to us from his home in Chennai. And I want to start, Jaya, by just asking about the impact of coronavirus on India. What is happening? Hmm. Uh, it's hard to avoid this issue because that seems to be the only thing that we're talking at our dining table, in front of televisions, wherever we go, and in our churches too. Uh, just some highlights. It is obviously beyond numbers. That's something that is emerging. While our media uh, plays with numbers and all, as though they are trying to keep track of a one-day international scorecard, you get to see these numbers played around. But I think... What is emerging is the human loss, the human tragedy that this is. Unfortunately, the administrators thought it was just simply by doing some good administrative rearrangement, like lockdown and other things, it'll, they could wish it away. It is not. So we are really struggling with this issue of these numbers. Are these numbers, do they numbers in India reflect reality or is it just a product of the minimal testing that we are doing. Is that the reason why our numbers are relatively low compared to the rest of the world, considering that we have 1.3 billion, just to say that we have only 1,117 infections this morning, doesn't really gel. So that's one fear that uh, all of us have. Is this, is this the whole truth? And then unfortunately, our governments are busy protecting their image. Uh, you see a whole generation of politicians who are so busy about their global image than about their domestic uh, well-being of their citizens. You wonder why, after all, this coronavirus was not caused by the Indian politicians. So I don't know why they're so protective of these numbers. <clears throat> you have a very market-driven understanding of politics these days. Uh, was unfortunate. The government refused to acknowledge that we were going through a depression. And, uh, but on top of it, we have the coronavirus infection that has been loaded on. So the economy is crumbling. So. Yeah. Can I uh, quote you, and I know you've seen it, uh, an Indian doctor who said uh, social mm. distancing is only an indulgence for the affluent. Uh, uh, you've got to have a house big enough. Uh, washing your hands 10 times a day is for the affluent. You've, most houses don't have running water. Uh, hand sanitizer is only for the affluent. Uh, hmm. We've seen images uh, when you got four hours notice that uh, you had to get back home and the borders are going to shut in India of just mass crowds of poor people. How are these policies impacting the poor? I read the tweet that you sent. It is very true that the government, for some reason, simply followed the script in terms of lockdown, health infrastructure, protocols of protection for the frontline health workers. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, I think it was essentially a middle class rich problem now that has been loaded on to the migrant workers. Uh, it is hard to ignore those numbers in India, but we seem to have successfully ignored. Suddenly, you have these huge marches of migrant workers basically wanting to go home. And our government has now sealed the state borders, put these migrant workers who probably walked uh, miles and kilometers into prisons, into jail-like situations in the name of quarantine. And those quarantine situations, believe me, Tim, are not the best. Yeah. You see pictures of these people crying. All that they want to do is, we want to go home. <clears throat> and now they quarantine. 
and we don't know what infection they're carrying. Once that reaches our villages and towns, we will have a community-based disaster. Currently, it's more targeted and focused in different places, primarily where the middle class and the rich are. But suddenly, you will start hearing this from our rural areas, where our health, health infrastructure is probably the weakest. But very interesting, in this process, uh, you see the, the cracks in the community in our country, like the caste, the wealth, beginning to play out. You suddenly say, or oh, this, you hear tweets and WhatsApp messages saying, good for them, I'm glad it happened. They needed this punishment. Uh, meaning the migrant workers, not the middle class and the rich. Uh, we're glad that our cities got rid of them. But it was on their, on their backs that the city functioned. Yeah. Uh, and suddenly they have disappeared and everybody's taken this holier than thou at a uh, position in saying, I'm glad we are out, they are out of our cities. Now our cities are cleaner, et cetera, et cetera. So that is one side. The other is the middle and the rich class are on a protect ourselves mode. So we do not want to take the risk of doing anything beyond our, earlier it used to be beyond our cities or beyond our communities. Now beyond our own apartments. We don't want to go out because lockdown, you know? Yeah. It's, it's come at a huge economic cost for us. It's extraordinary that at one level uh, we have discovered we're all the same. Every person is vulnerable to the virus. Boris mm. Johnson and Tom Hanks, the actor, mm. uh, we're all vulnerable. But mm. in terms of who gets help, who gets treatment, suddenly the cracks of caste, of mm. who's poor, are all opening up. And that must be on a massive scale, potentially, in India. Very true. And uh, how the, the richer hospitals and the rich and the middle class have monopoly on ventilators, um, masks, hand sanitizers, they have all become important political tools in the hands of our politicians. And the ones on the margins, like our migrant workers, walk around with their own uh, towels and things like that to protect themselves and walk miles uh, to be safe and simply to go home. So you see that happening, the rich, the wealth beginning to play. That's one which is very evident. Religion is another one that's coming up very strongly. For some strange reason, uh, we seem to pick on the Muslims. Uh, that it is their community that has not followed the lockdown rules. Uh, and then you have that situation. And many of our religious leaders offering explanations as to why this happened. And invariably, they are all full of judgment, uh, very little of compassion. So we are going through a very, the cracks are beginning to show when this pandemic hit India. You know? I was fascinated that you made a comment to me that uh, President Modi has convened Hindu gurus for advice. So the religious lens is obviously very powerful, very different to an Australia and who's asked to advise the, the Prime Minister. Yeah, the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has invited the Hindu gurus to ask their advice on the coronavirus. But invariably, he has addressed the nation two times. Invariably, there are strong religious tones in those messages. I don't know whether he realizes it tends to marginalize many of our other minorities who also are victims of this infection. Uh, it's being done because Mahabharata says this. It's being done because it's a sacred time. That's why this particular curfew uh, and this particular um, banging of plates it's it, a, all a, of them a have, sacred season. It, it's they are exploiting it for their religious, yeah. religious slash political gain at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell us um, are there stories of hope in this crisis that you're seeing? Yeah, well, yes. Uh, <clears throat> we have, of course. I think this is a common story across nations. The heroism of many of our frontline workers, health workers. They are there, uh, not only giving their best, but also in many places, because they are among the infected, they get stigmatized in their own community. 
uh, and they are still out there. I think we need to celebrate them. In many of our villages, they have created their own volunteer group to cordon the village off, in some sense, protect the village and handle that piece. We have many of our uh, neighbors helping each other. Uh, we have people packing food packets and giving it to uh, the, especially the poorer uh, sections of our community who have gone into economic loss because of the lockdown. We have people employing the poorer people and saying, you don't need to come, stay at home, but here's a salary. So you see those kinds of great stories. But the other thing which got my attention recently was our uh, legal uh, fraternity, how they are taking up the cases of the minorities who are not served well and uh, filing cases for them. So they, a lot of them are following the legal route as well. Uh, we also see the opposition beginning to find a new voice in the situation, saying... This is the Congress yeah, party. Congress and other parties too. And other parties. Saying, yeah, saying we want to fully support, we are with the government, but have you considered this perspective? Have you considered this option? Which I think is an important positive play. Uh, you almost have a sense of a national unity at the political, among the political parties. Yes, India is uh, such a huge, complex country with so many minorities. Uh, it's interesting how we focus always on our own. So in Australia, the news has interviewed Australians in India in self-isolation, saying mm. we're very fearful that Indians are saying this is a foreign virus, foreigners have introduced it. We, as Australian foreigners, are now feeling very afraid. Uh, that has been the Australian reporting on India. <laughs> we have uh, similar stories from Northeast India because they have a little of the Chinese look. So when they go out in public, they say, oh, it's from you, so don't come into our shops and things like that. You have those stories. But I think we, we are, I don't think we're targeting these foreigners, so-called non-resident Indians who come to India. But I think there is a fear in two levels. One is the fear of the infection, but the fear of the government, which I think thanks to this current government, they have done it, instilled in us that fear. So yeah. it's working. Mm. And when we talk of stories of hope, um, you as a, a theologian, as well as an activist, have thought a lot about hope. What is a theology of hope as you understand it? Mm. Um, so I, I like the way the church is forced to rethink about herself or itself. Uh, the four walls don't, don't exist anymore. Uh, and suddenly the church is out there in the public domain asking, at least selfishly, how do we care for our members? How do we serve our members? So that, I think, is an evidence that the church needs to rethink church in India. And I am glad this particular pandemic has forced us to rethink. The church has become a seven day business rather than a Sunday business. So that's another big uh, breaking of the wall. But unfortunately, the church is not there in the public domain. Uh, the, the public conversation or the public domain is not missing the voice of the church from India. Uh, clearly shows that there has been an absentee in the public domain in India, which is a very sad situation to be in uh, because you and I, we know our theology of hope is based on the knowledge that our God is involved, but you have a church that is not involved. So we need to get our act together because our theology doesn't match with our practice. So that's an area I think we need to look at. We are, uh, there is this whole conversation about grief that is happening, the grief about whether I'm the next candidate for this infection, the grief whether our neighbor is safe enough for us to interact, uh, grief about uh, distant family members, uh, also grief about how long we don't know the due date on this or the end, end date on this. Uh, you would think this grief conversation 
would naturally move people to questions about where is God. Uh, but looks like that question is still uh, not raised or not addressed in the public conversation. And I wonder, Tim, whether we have over the years successfully secularized our society so much, whether our secularism is the new opium yeah. uh, that has kind of allowed, cost us to simply go into a state of numbness when grief hits us, rather than searching for new solutions. That's something that I'm wondering whether we have a God who grieves. We don't have a God who stays aloof when we grieve. And that is another source of theology, a source of hope for us, because our God is right in the middle, grieving along with us, with the migrants, with the rich and the middle class too. No? So I'm hoping that we will somewhere trip into that. Yeah, I'm very struck that in um, the Hebrew prophets, uh, uh, lament and grief over loss, over exile, over the temple mm. destroyed, mm -hmm. uh, the people mm -hmm. gone into exile, mm. moves to. And this is a tremendous loss for God. God's mm -hmm. heart is broken uh, mm -hmm. with people in exile, with suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if we can't grieve that, we only have a secular worldview that we're self-invented mm -hmm. and we're self-sufficient mm -hmm. and uh, God is not alive or active, uh, almost irrelevant. Um, that that uh, is a secular worldview, and certainly mm -hmm. we are starting here in Australia to say, in isolation, what's the meaning of my life here in isolation? Mm -hmm. Is there a purpose mm -hmm. for my life? Does mm -hmm. it align with the Christian story that we're created for purpose? Is that some of the, uh, the theology of grief and hope we need? Uh, I think the church, I. I I, I like not only does uh, we, do we have a God who grieves, but we are a community that needs to grieve with this, with the people. And I think you see evidences of that people saying, listening to all these and reading about all this, there's almost a sense of, I would like to cry for our migrant workers. I would like to cry for our health workers who are not protected. I would also like to, uh, cry for a government which is out of its depth on how to deal with these situations. So that lamenting is a fundamental part of our spirituality. That needs to be rediscovered. For some reason, we have lament is seen as a position of weakness. Um, Bible says no lament is part of that spirituality because we have a God who grieves with us. And when our nation see that we are a community that grieves with them, would probably say, is this the redeeming community that we should look at? Um, but like I say, we have developed such a self-sufficient understanding of human beings and human institutions. We are numb at this stage. Mm. And, also the, yeah. and also the the collapse of the powerful. That is another one that's being painted out nation after nation. People who thought they had strong foundations, flourished with lies, flourished with manipulation and instilling fear. And like Habakkuk says, whose might was their God, suddenly you see them exposed, have clay feet. And, and institutions and infrastructure we thought is good enough and we don't need God and suddenly you see them all crumbling. And then in an economy where information and knowledge is our new currency, suddenly we are all sounding like ignorant people talking to each other. Uh, no information about what we really don't know what we don't know. So that is another interesting situation, wondering where God is in all this. Certainly the uh, Christian story <laughs> says created, not self-invented. It says purpose, mm. not just competitive productivity to consume. Very good. Very it good. Uh, says mm. rather than self-sufficient, humble and dependent. Uh, mm. um, can you tell us in these times how your family, your church, your neighbours are doing, Jayakuma? 
Uh, it's all quiet, completely quiet. <laughs> uh, my wife was saying the other day, around 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, you could hear the, hear the birds sing, which is very <laughs> unusual. We hear them very early in the morning. Uh, as a family, I think uh, it's given us a lot of time for uh, relationships. We find ourselves calling each other, talking to each other, inquiring about each other. So there's a lot of uh, building of relationships that is happening. Otherwise, our calendars kept us busy. You know? And uh, time was coming in the way of relationships. Now time is at our call. And uh, we are able to invest a lot in relationships, family relationships. We particularly uh, focused on some of our church members and some of our friends who are aged and who are vulnerable health-wise, uh, constantly in touch with them, asking them how they are, do you need anybody, uh, putting them in touch with some younger friends close to their area to buy provisions and things like that. So we are hoping to, that is another area that has grown in terms of sitting in your room, in your home, we are able to call and inquire and put people in touch with each other. So that's the other one. I have a lot of time for reflection, reading of books, studying. So that has been very good. Games. Uh, then we have this whole younger generation in our WhatsApp family WhatsApp group. Around for some strange reason, around two o'clock, they all wake up and start sending each other riddles and quizzes. And our WhatsApp is all so full of, and invariably suddenly you feel your age completely not able to <laughs> grapple with those. <laughs> Just the joy that our joy that our younger generation is able to bring to our conversation. So those have been very good. Well, we are made in the image of a relational God, aren't we? And, uh, I know, I know. And when we rediscover relationship, we're rediscovering uh, alignment with God in some ways. Mm. Um, Jaya, it has been an absolute delight and uh, you will be in our prayers. India will be in our prayers. And, uh, Thanks, Tim. Mm. Uh, we, we know we know that the God we serve uh, has got this. So thank you so much for sharing your messages of hope. Thank you very much, Tim. God bless you. Keep in touch.